We have started yesterday with a steady diffusion equation and we have been looking at the control volume in 1D, so that is a cell here with a node xj and the faces, for example the eastern face at xj plus 1 half is the midway between xj and xj plus 1. And then uh, we have been looking at the discretization of the uh, steady diffusion equation and we use the differences to dis discretize the phi dx, phi is our uh, the flow or thermal variable and then we saw that we end up with an uh, uh, equation where the center node is involved for example here, that is the AT. AT is then a coefficient and the phi T is the unknown there and the phi W, phi E are the unknowns in the western and eastern cells. SU is the part of the source term which we have limited. Then we said we can also write that then in the form with the index notation and uh, which gets them this form. Now we brought everything on the left hand side. You see here the correspondence, the AJ corresponds to AP, EJ to the minus AW, CJ to the minus AE, and DJ to the SU. Now we want to implement boundary conditions. So we start by implementing a directly boundary condition at the left boundary. So we use then a directly boundary condition. And that is then the following. We say that our um, unknown thermal or flow variable phi at the left boundary, which is xA, is equal to some given value phi A. So that is something that we get. For example, it would be a thermal problem then we say we want to have the temperature at the left boundary to a fixed uh, value. So then we need to approximate the derivative at the boundary. So we approximate the derivative of phi d phi dx at xa. And that is then the western phase of, our, of the first control volume. That is west, so a western phase um, W, little w, um, of the first control volume of the first cell. So, what does that look like? Imagine if we look from, from as we started looking from the, uh, from the front, then we would have our left boundary, uh, and that would be the left boundary of the domain here, and we would have the cell, say that would be the cell uh, 1, so that would be x1, so that would be the cell 1. And uh, then this, the left boundary of the domain will also be the western boundary of the cell 1. This will be east. So this will be then the cell, the, the, the faces of the first cell. So then uh, we do this approximation in the following way. We approximate the d phi dx at the western face, that is at x a, by what can we do there? Well, if you think of it, if we would plot on this axis now, let's see, we do it differently. If we do that now again here, we have x a. We have here our first cell, x one, and if we have phi here. So assume that the, the phi A 
is given at the boundary. And what we compute is, say, a value in the cell um, 1 that we locate at the node x1. So that would be then the phi 1. And then we can use simply the final difference approximation using this, uh, these, the value that we want to compute, the phi 1, and the boundary condition to get the derivative. So then we do that, then either we call it phi 1 or we call it, we might also call it phi p. So we use either notation. We call this either cell p or cell 1, depending whether we use index notation or the notation from Patanka p e w. So we start with that notation. It would be then that we take the value in the cell p minus the boundary value divided by the distance between x1 and xa. So and therefore we, we can also have also introduced this notation for that. That is the distance between uh, point p and point a. So that is this distance here. That is the distance delta x a p. Or we write it in the index notation by phi 1 minus phi a divided by x1 minus x a. So that we use the final difference approximation. So then we can use that in our general formula for uh, the approximation of the steady diffusion equation. And that general formula, that was formula 1. So that was uh, the formula where we had the diffusive fluxes of the east and the west and the source term. So that is then approximated by using this uh, um, boundary treatment. following way, um, we have zero on the left because we have no time derivative, no convection because the velocity is zero. And we do the discretization at the eastern phase in just the same way as we do for the interior because we have both the right and the left neighbor, eastern and uh, west neighbor. So that is then the uh, the diffusion coefficient at the eastern phase times the area of our control volume, which we assume to be constant because we have constant cross section, and then we have the phi e minus the phi p. So that is the general that is the, divided by the distance between the points e, p and e. So now we take also then some neighbors into account. Well, it would be the x2 or it would be the e. And that is all for getting the flux at e, which is corresponding then to x. In our case, it would be x1 plus 1 half. So there we can use the standard approximation of the diffusive flux. And now we use what we have here. First, the diffusion coefficient can be evaluated with a boundary condition with phi a. No approximation is needed. And now we do the approximation then of the derivative. And there we use this formula, what we have uh, said here. So it will be phi p minus phi a divided by the distance between the boundary point and the first uh, the grid point in the so semi point. So that is the discretization of the fluxes, of the diffusive fluxes at the eastern and the western phase, in the particular case that we are in the first cell where the western um, diffusive flux is then approximated in this way. And then we have the source term, and there we use the same linearization as we used, used also for the interior, that is we have a uniform part, and we have a part that is depending on our solution in the uh, cell P times the unknown in the cell P. So now we can order that. We do it again that we take the unknown on the left, and then not the unknown, but the, the unknown regarding P on the left. So 
equivalent to in that is this equation 17. So what we do that as we discussed also yesterday, we take this on the left hand side and we get gamma e divided by the distance from t to e times the area and we get here we get also a contribution phi p and that has now uh, containing the gamma a divided by the distance between the boundary and the um, first uh, midpoint so our also a, a, a node times the area and then we get also from this contribution we get on the left because this contains 5p and that gets a minus when we take it over and that is then 5p and on the right hand side we uh, keep then what is related to e and to uh, the rest regarding e you see we get this contribution here that is then the gamma e divided by the distance between p and e times the area, that is phi e. And we get something here that is actually given by the boundary condition. And that is then the, um, let's see, that is the gamma a divided by the distance between the boundary and the first three point P and the times the area and that is times phi A that is the boundary condition that is given and we have this uniform part from the source term so now we can identify again the coefficients and uh, we can do that in the following way that we say this here is then the AP. This is the AE. If we like, we could also call this the AW. But it is now not depending on W, but it's depending now on depending on the boundary condition. And we know that. So that we know this term here, so we can also call this now here. As, because everything is known as a modified uh, source term where we have included this part. So then we get exactly the same form as we had for the interior. Um, if we would actually introduce the phi A as a new uh, unknown that is given to us by the boundary condition. So you can formulate that in the following way. So we could stop here and just say, okay, now we have closed our system on the left hand side, but we could also say, let's just do what we also did in the interior and um, use the boundary condition as an additional um, uh, equation. So that is then 17 can be expressed as the equation 13. That was the general equation for interior um, cell. We could do that here in the same way when we would introduce then here the, the W. W and also here, everywhere, but with the boundary condition that we say the phi w is equal to the boundary, given boundary condition. So we can do it either way. So, then we have closed the system on the left side. Now we do it just the same thing on the right side to take also the boundary condition at the right into account. So we use now then also a directly boundary condition at the right boundary. So the directly boundary condition 
at the right boundary. That will be then that we say the phi at the right boundary is xv is equal to given to some quantity phi b. So that is then given beforehand. So here the situation is now the following, that we have our um, a domain, and the domain ends at xb. And we have here our cell nj with the node xnj. And what we want, so this is now the, if we take this as p, this is now the eastern boundary, that is the boundary of the domain, the right boundary of the domain. And this is the western. So what we need to compute then is the flux here. Because we cannot compute in the usual way, because we have no right neighbor. So then we do it just in a similar way as we discussed for the, for the left boundary. That means we approximate uh, the, the uh, derivative with the define the x at xb. And that is then the eastern uh, the face, the eastern face. E of um, the last control volume. Or cell NJ. So then we get the following. Similar, then in a similar spirit as we discussed before, that we approximate the derivative at the eastern phase by taking the value that we have at the, the boundary here minus the value that we have in P divided by the distance that we have uh, between the point P and the boundary uh, B. And in the index notation that would correspond to, say, to saying that we take the boundary condition at the right boundary minus the value that we want to compute is <coughs> cell nj divided by the distance of these of the boundary and the grid point which is the midpoint uh, nj so if we do that then we can approximate 5 uh, in the following way that is again our general expression for uh, for the steady diffusion equation so then phi is then approximated phi and we get then let's see it's easier to write it here we get then zero on the left hand side and now we have the eastern flux and for the eastern flux we need first the diffusion coefficient and we know it because we have the boundary condition there. So we can evaluate gamma with phi uh, b. So that we can just use times the area and then the approximation of the derivative. Um, that is what we have discussed here. So that is then phi b minus phi p divided by the distance between p and b. And then the western flux is computed in the usual way. There we don't need to do any special. So there we have then the gamma w. There we use either arithmetic or harmonic mean times the area of, the, of our control volume, which is constant, times the approximation of the derivative at the western phase, which is then given by the difference between p and phi at uh, the points P and W, divided by the distance of these points. 
and we have to take into account the source term, which is done by the uniform part, and the part that is depending on P, which is SP times phi P. And then we order this. So that is then equivalent to, that is now equation 20. We put everything regarding the phi P again on the left hand side. Now I start with the, <coughs> uh, the W part here, that is gamma W divided by the distance between the grid points and mid points. No, there are the grid points here. We are now talking about grid points. W P and times the area minus no plus because the phi p, this gets with plus on the other side, so it's gamma p divided by the distance between p and b times the area, and this gets again with a minus on the left hand side, sp times the unknown in p. And that is equal to, now we take the western, what is left here, that is then minus minus gives plus. So then we get the gamma W divided by the distance between the grid points W and P times the area. That is times phi W. And we get a contribution from the boundary condition here that is regarding uh, phi b, so that is then the gamma of d divided by the distance between p and b times the area times the boundary condition. And we have the uniform part of the source term that SU. So now we can again identify the coefficients. So this would then be the coefficient a p. This would be the coefficient a capital W. This the coefficient a uh, a e in this case. Or yeah, we can call it like that. And then we see we get again a similar formula as we had for the interior points. The difference is that now this phi is not phi e but phi b, which we know. It's a boundary condition. known uh, from the boundary condition, this that is a uniform part from the source term, we could also identify this here as the modified uh, source term SU tilde. So where we take this solution <coughs> from the boundary condition into uh, the part that is unchanged. Of course that doesn't change when we do the computation. So, then we can also express them this, as I said, in the general form when we introduce for the, the phi b uh, the unknown uh, phi e. So, that is the 20 can be expressed in the general form for the interior cells if we then introduce an additional equation by the boundary condition phi e equals to phi b. So then we have um, all the equations that we need and then we yeah. can just put together the equations from the interior and the equations from the boundaries that we just derived. So that we can do just a little bit more space.
So, then we do that. So the end is that we get now, when, we, when I write linear, I assume that these uh, diffusion coefficients are not depending on phi. If they were, we would take them at the old iteration level so that we get something linear. So the linear system of equations that is then given by the interior, by equation 13, with the boundary treatment that we just discussed, that was equation 20 that can enters and I think the other was uh, 17 yeah so that was the boundary treatment so the boundary treatment 17 and 20 um, that corresponds to following dry diagonal linear system. So, what do we get? Um, we get, if we use the form, if you remember from uh, 17, we had AP that will be in the diagonal, and we we'll get here our unknowns will then be our say the unknown. Now I have to use here an index that will be the unknown in the first cell that is the cell next to the boundary. That was the one that we discussed uh, in the beginning. So, and then the next coefficient that cuts coming here, remember. First it was on the right hand side, now we get it on the left hand side. So therefore it will here be a minus AE. And that will operate on 2 phi 2. The rest will be 0. And on the right hand side, then we use this uh, tilde notation that we introduced in equation 17, which contains the uniform part of the source term and the contribution from the uh, left boundary condition. Then in the second row, we will get the minus a w because uh, the equation that we are using here is the equation a p phi p is equal to a w phi w plus a e phi e plus s u. So, and we bring the unknowns now all on the left hand side, so this gets therefore a minus, like this got a minus. So that is multiplying on this. In the diagonal we have an AP, and here we have another minus AE. And if things would be varying, then we would have, uh, these would not be constant, but they would depend on the local values. And this will continue all the way down, to the right boundary, and then if we get close to the right boundary, then we would have um, at the next but last cell, we would have a minus AE, we would have an AP, and a minus AW. And they would then operate on here, we would have then the phi NJ minus one. <coughs> And this would be the phi nj. So in the last row, we will then use what we have here. So we will then use the ap. That will then operate on the phi p, which is in the phi nj. So that will be the ap. And the minus aw, when we bring that on the left hand side, it gets the minus will then multiply phi nj minus 1, aw. 
And uh, let's see. Oh, here I got it in the wrong in the wrong place. Sorry for that. So it should be phi n j minus one phi n j, and that is our uh, unknown vector. Here we have the matrix, and the rest here is just zero. So we have only three diagonals. That makes the name tri diagonal. And the right-hand side, we have not yet completed that. From number 2 to number nj minus 1, we use the formula for the interior. So we'll have here the uniform part from the source term, which might change. And in the last uh, row of the right-hand side, we use then this term coming from the boundary treatment which includes the boundary treatment at the right and the uniform part of the source term. So that is what we call the SU tilde. So that is the right hand side. So then we get here a matrix A, that is the matrix A, times our unknown vector phi, and on the right hand side we get some known right hand side that we might call the D. And then we can also translate that into the um, index form. Here we have the form with a PEW, but we can also translate it to the index form. So we have derived these algebraic equations for the interior. And now in this lecture, for the left and the right boundary, and we put, if we put that together, we get this system of equations. So that is one option, or in index notation, <coughs> that would be then the following one. Let's see that I call that now the coming one 21. Then we call the, we, these uh, get now, um, the uh, diagonals are called A, with the corresponding index of the row. This will be called C, and this will be called B. And then we will have here the C1, we will have here the B2, the A2, the C2, and this will continue all the way <coughs> down to B, N, J minus 1. A and J minus 1 and C and J minus 1. And the last row will contain the B and J and the A and J. So, and then the rest is again 0. You see the notation is that the A with index corresponds to the AP. The B with index corresponds to the minus AW and the C with the next corresponds to the minus A. The unknowns are the, the same, phi 1, phi 2, phi nj minus 1, phi nj, and the right hand side is then if we would call the, the, the D, the SU tilde for the left boundary condition, D1 tilde, we get this, otherwise we get here the D2s and so on, with D and J minus 1, and again we include the boundary term to the uniform source term at the right, we will get here an NJ tilde. So that would be then again the same thing, matrix A times unknown vector phi is equal to the right hand side D. So that means the discretization by the finite volume method leads to a tridiagonal linear system. If we would have a dependence on, of the diffusion coefficient gamma on phi, then we could do a linearization and keep that co coefficient constant for one iteration, and then we would get similar matrices, but we would have to iterate to improve on that. Okay, so then, we have done the step two, we have done the discretization of the um, integral form of the steady diffusion equation and we received then 
this uh, system of equations, and the step three is then to, to solve that. Remember step one was the grid generation that was essentially telling where we have the nodes, where we have the faces, and then doing the discretization by the finite volume method that is what we have done now, ending and leading to a system of equations. And the third step is then to solve that system of equations. solution of system of equations. So now we have to analyze our system a little bit in more detail and there we shall make use of the fact that the AP the center coefficient is the sum of the coefficient of the, uh, of the subdiagonals, A, uh, W, and AE, for example here, minus the coefficient from the source term. And it turns out that we can make, uh, well, we, that it can adva take advantage of that in many cases, this matrix will be diagonally dominant. And that is a useful property. We have already seen that for the uh, implicit order equation, for the heat equation, the diffusion equation. Now we use it also for the steady diffusion equation. Because when the matrix is, if the matrix is diagonally dominant, then we can use the TDMA or the tridiagonal matrix algorithm to solve it. So then we just state if the tridiagonal matrix that we got by the finite volume discretization of the steady diffusion equation, if that matrix A is diagonally dominant, we have already seen what this means, so we repeat it here. That means that in our case, the following two conditions have to be satisfied. The sum of the moduli of the off diagonals, I take now this form here, <coughs> that is the absolute value of bj plus cj. That are <coughs> our off diagonal elements, and we take the absolute value and the sum of them. That has to be smaller than the absolute value, smaller equal than the absolute value of the diagonal coefficient. And that has to be true for all j. In our case, for j from 1 to nj. That is the basic requirement. But we need, in addition, a little bit more. We need that also the inequality holds for at least 1j. So that the sum of the moduli of the off diagonals, absolute value of bj plus absolute value of cj, is smaller than the diagonal <coughs> element aj. That has to be true for at least 1j. So that is the definition here of the angular dominant. So in mathematics you find some definitions which might differ from that strictly diagonal dominance or so on, but we take this as the definition. So if that is the case, then we can solve the linear system by the Thomas algorithm or the TDMA. So if that is true, if this, so this is completes the diagonal dominance definition, That is the definition of diagonal dominance. So if we have this true, then the system of equations, now we take it in this form here, can be solved um, by LU decomposition. So 
without pivoting. So that is the standard technique for solving linear systems. But the, the situation that we don't need pivoting, that is row interchange, is due to the diagonal dominance. And that algorithm that we get by using LU decomposition, that is then the Thomas algorithm. That algorithm uh, is called, so the mathematicians or numerical analysts, they call it Thomas algorithm. And you find also that name in the, our textbook by Fletcher Tannehill Anderson. Or, that is then maybe more frequent in the, the CFD community, otherwise, called TDMA, which stands for Tridiagonal Matrix Algorithm. So, then you just have to uh, repeat that, that we have gone through in the previous course, Introduction to CFD TP4280. If you are not familiar with that, you can read it in the textbook. So there is a, it's described in the textbook. But you can also use any good book on numerical analysis. I like the book by Michael Heath on scientific computing, where you have the derivation of that. So, then we proceed. And, uh, well, if we, if we have done that, we have solved the problem. Because when, you have, when we have the solution then, by solving this by the Thomas algorithm, then we have this vector, and then we know the solution. That's it. So, what we want to do now is to look uh, into other cases where we have uh, different uh, boundary conditions. That is mainly, that is, that is uh, Neumann boundary conditions. But, uh, <coughs> you can see, we are at the break time, so we do that. Uh, but before doing, going to break, I again want to remind you of the event tomorrow, and that is the uh, introduction to Fokker. That is tomorrow, so there will be no um, guidance on exercise 7 tomorrow in the evening. Instead, there will be an introduction to Fokker.